Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Sunday Night Live from Pineville Church of Christ. It's just me here at the church building, but we're live with all of those who are out there watching us and joining us, and we appreciate you and your encouragement. I hope you'll go ahead and comment something so that we can kind of get an idea of how many folks are out there live. Several more will view this later on after it's posted after it's live, but we'd like to know how many are watching live. So go ahead and make a comment of some kind just so that we know that you're out there. Over the years, a lot of people have come to me, sat down in my office with tears in their eyes and confessed their struggles to me. And they will ask me questions like, will I ever get rid of all this temptation? Will I ever reach a point where uh, I, can, I can go days, weeks, months without sinning? Will I ever evolve or grow into the man or woman of integrity that I really want to be for God? And I hate to be fatalistic or negative, but my answer is no, you never will reach that point this side of heaven. Now, when we shed this body and we get to go on into heaven, then we'll be perfect as the Lord is perfect. But right now in this life, because we're human beings, Despite our best efforts, we are always going to struggle with sin. The Bible is full of many great characters, many men and women of God, great men and women of God who often struggled with sin. When I look at the New Testament and think of people like that in the New Testament, Paul comes to the forefront of my mind. The great apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, he said, sometimes I do the thing that I know I'm not supposed to do. And sometimes I fail to do the things that I know I should do. And at the end of that chapter, he, he cries out in disgust with himself. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm just a wretched man. And yet, despite the wretchedness of Paul's struggles with sin, he comes to the end of his life in 2 Timothy and he says, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my course. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, is about to give to me. Despite his struggles with sin, Paul was confident that he was about to go to heaven. When I think about characters like this in the Old Testament, David is the one who stands out to me. And tonight we conclude our series that we've been looking at off and on, on the life of David, a series that we've titled Finding the Heart to Go On. Has there ever been a guy ever whose life was more confounded and confused than David? David, at, at one point, risks his life to fight Goliath, and at another point, lies to save his own neck and invites the slaughter of a whole village. David is the guy who repeatedly forgave wicked Saul, but seems to have taken a grudge against a man called Shammai to the grave even though Shammai's offense against David was far less than what Saul had done to David. At times in his life, David was the epitome, the example of integrity and wholesomeness. And he's the same David that on another occasion murders his own friend. David's life is a giant pendulum that swings back and forth between the pit and the, pendulum, or, and the pinnacle, a pendulum swinging from one extreme to the next, from the pit to the pinnacle, and yet David goes down in history, biblical history, as a man after God's own heart. David is sort of an every man's man. He's somebody that we can relate to because we struggle with sin in, in many of the same ways that David did. David, Paul, the apostles of Jesus, every one of them were imperfect. Think about Peter and how he denied the Lord three times, and Peter kept sticking his foot in his mouth when he opened his mouth to speak. I think about James and John, who were sons of thunder, Jesus called them. And on one occasion, they wanted to call down fire from heaven to devour and burn up a whole city of Samaritans. And yet John, who wanted that, grows into who we come to know as the apostle of love. He certainly didn't start out being a very loving person, the apostle of love. But we can identify with these men because they're so imperfect and they were struggling. 
And Jesus said about the apostles on one occasion, the spirit indeed is, is willing, but the flesh is weak. And maybe that's the secret to finding the heart to go on. And despite our mistakes and struggles with sins, to be like David, to be like the apostles and Paul and Peter and James and John, and, and, and to find the secret uh, to being a faithful Christian. It's not being a perfect Christian. It's just never giving up. It's always fighting the good fight, even though you're going to win some battles against uh, uh, the devil and you're going to lose some battles against temptation. You never quit fighting. You never quit struggling. I tell people who come to me and confess these struggles with sin that, listen, if you stay humble and you stay convicted of your sins in your heart and you continue to feel bad about your sins and you don't ever give up, I'm not going to worry about you. It's when you start getting too self-satisfied with your Christian life or when you give up the struggle, that's when I would worry about you. But you stay humble and keep admitting that you have sin in your life, that you never give up the struggle, keep fighting the good fight, keep heading in the right direction and never give up the struggle. I think you're going to be okay by God's grace. You're going to be okay. That of all the things we learn from the life of David, that's what I, I've learned the most is to never give up, no matter how much I sin, to keep fighting the good fight. Why would God choose a man like David to have more written about him in the Bible than any other Bible character? Why is David on more pages of our Bibles than any other Bible character? Why would God choose this guy to be the king of his chosen people? Why would God choose a man like David to author the songbook for the centuries, the book of Psalms? Why would God want David to be the one to prefigure the Christ, the Messiah? Maybe it's because it's not about David. It's about God. It's about what God can do with a man like David, what God can do in the life of an ordinary person who struggles with sin. The more imperfect David is, the more it points out the greatness and perfection of God, that God could accomplish such great things with an imperfect man and a sinful man like David, all the more plays up the greatness of God. It's not the story of David, it's the story of God and what God can do with a man like David. It's the story of what God can do with a person like you. If you never give up, if you keep finding the heart to keep on keeping on, it's about your heart. God knew David's heart. God knew David wasn't a perfect liver of uh, the, the commandments of God. He didn't perfectly have the fortitude to follow through on living a righteous life. But usually David had the right heart. And that's what's most important with God is that we have the right heart. It's not where we are on our journey with God that matters so much as that we are on the journey and that we don't give up and that we're headed in the right direction. It's not about how fast we're traveling on our spiritual journey with God. It's about that we're still traveling on our journey with God and we never give up. David was a man after God's own heart. God looked at David's heart and knew that his heart was what it ought to be. And God can look at your heart and know that though your life is imperfect, your heart's in the right place. Your, your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. And God is able to see that. David prayed, my heart is fixed on you, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And even though God refused to let David build the temple for him, he still complimented David for having the idea to build the temple and said, David, you did well to have this in your heart. You see, God is able to see what's in a person's heart and to compliment them for that and to judge a person by their heart, not by their, their struggles, if they're keeping on trying to struggle, to judge them by their intentions that are in the right place. The problem when we realize that it's about our heart, not about how perfectly we live our life before God, but more about our heart. Once we come to that realization, it can be helpful to us 
in not giving up when we struggle with sin until we start getting confused by our own heart. Yes, it is about what's in our heart, but then sometimes we doubt our own hearts. And our hearts lie to us and tell us things that are not true sometimes. Did you ever know that Jeremiah 17, 9 was in the Bible? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Think about what that verse says about our human hearts. My heart is deceptive. My heart can't be cured. My heart can't be fathomed or understood. And my fickle heart sometimes confuses me. So how can I take courage when my own heart lets me down sometimes? Hal is a rich man who loves to write checks and make big donations to help the kingdom of God grow. But he admits that every time he makes one of those big don donations as a rich man, that it gives him sort of a power trip. And so he worries in his heart every time he gives generously as a wealthy man. Randall is a preacher for a large church, and he enjoys studying God's word and sharing the gospel and, and leading people to, to Jesus Christ through the gospel. But sometimes he admits that even in the middle of his sermons, he thinks about how great it is to have hundreds of people hanging on your every word and, and having that kind of power of sway over them. He says, it's an eco rush for me. And so I worry about my ego in my heart. Doris is a woman who ended an extramarital affair years and years ago, but she never told her husband or her children. Her family doesn't know. And she's told herself over the years, it would just make things worse. And I'm sparing them by, by not telling them. But sometimes she worries, am I not telling them because I'm afraid to face the music? So she worries about her heart. These are a few examples of the kind of struggles that people have when they don't understand their own hearts and they doubt their own hearts. People sometimes try to run away from God to run away from their sins, to hide from God, or to hide their sins from God. But David prayed like this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there too. We can run, but we cannot hide from God. And we can never hide from ourselves and from our own deceptive heart. So here's the last bit of encouragement I want to give you. When your heart condemns you, remember that God is greater than your heart. That's 1 John 3 and verse 20. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Don't listen to your fickle heart when it's telling you negative things. If you know that you have not given up the struggle, that you're making a good faith effort to live for God, Though you sometimes sin and struggle with sin, don't let your heart condemn you because of that. David wasn't perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Peter, James, and John and the other apostles weren't perfect. All the great men and women of God in Scripture, none of them were perfect. So when your heart condemns you, don't give up. Find the heart to keep going on knowing that God is greater than your heart. When your heart condemns you, don't listen to your old fickle heart. Listen to God. Don't trust in your own doubts. Doubt your doubts. Trust what God says. God speaks to us through his word. Let God speak to you through his word. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Bible tells us that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of morrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God, through his word, discerns the heart. He knows what's in your heart better than you know what's in your heart. He understands our hearts, and only he can lead us in the paths of righteousness. David prayed in Psalm 139 like this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
Ask God to know your thoughts and your hearts and trust him to do it. He knows what's in your real heart of hearts. That's what's important. There was a fellow I read about who went to visit his aged mother. His mother had come from poor beginnings. She had married young, had little education, and faced extremely tough circumstances. But she had hung in there over the years and cheerfully reared her family. And this son went and visited his aged mother and asked him, asked her, Mama, how did you do it? How did you do it? She thought for a minute. She said, well, son, I just decided to get up and go on. Every day, with every challenge, I just decided to get up and keep going on. Sometimes it really is that simple. Just keep on keeping on. Never give up. Just keep following the Lord. And you won't always do it perfectly. David certainly didn't. <laughs> but you'll probably follow the Lord better than David did. And if he could go down in history after a man as a man after God's own heart, then you can too, but not if you give up. You got to stay on the path of righteousness and never quit following God. Just follow God the best you can. Follow his word the best you can and let him take care of the rest through his grace. Think about the 23rd Psalm. In this beautifully constructed Psalm, David, first of all, begins talking about God. And then in the middle of it, he transitions to talking to God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's another transition that happens within the 23rd Psalm. David transitions from speaking of God as his loving shepherd to talking about God and to God as his gracious host. And at the end of that Psalm, in that section about God being David's gracious host, David concludes by saying, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He knew he was a sinner. David sinned often and sinned some big sins, but he was confident that God's mercy would follow him all the days of his life. And in the end, he said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to encourage you to develop the determination of David, to have the same kind of David's dogged determination You'll never be able to unravel the mysteries of your heart. Keep going on anyway. Follow God the best you can. Find the resolute intentionality of the attitude of David and say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, not because of my goodness, but because of God's goodness and God's mercy. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Don't think like this. Don't think, well, if I'm good enough, then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Turn that around and think of it this way. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that confidence, that assurance helps me to keep going on. Every time I mess up, I get up and I go on because I know that in the end, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My misery is answered by God's mercy. God's on my side. God's on your side. He wants you to succeed at Christian living. He is long-suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And you can be saved by God's grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We've been saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Lord is my shepherd. I will just follow and trust him to get me home to his house where I will dwell with him forever. As a penitent confessing believer in Christ, we can baptize you for your salvation. After all, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
If you would reach out to us, we can make arrangements to baptize you as soon as possible. If you've already made a commitment to the Lord in baptism, but have been unfaithful in your service, I hope you'll confess that and repent of that and let us know of your intention to rededicate yourself to the Lord. We'll pray with you and we'll encourage you. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we need you every hour of every day. We need you in every season of our lives. Dear God, our prayer is that you would be with us and keep leading us. Father, we need your guidance and your grace. We need your love. We need your mercy, your forgiveness, and your compassion. We need your spirit and your presence. Forgive us, Father, of every wrong, every mistake and sin in our lives. Through the blood of Jesus, forgive us. Help us to never give up, but to be determined to keep following and to always find the heart to go on. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, God, for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I heard an old, old story, how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and calls the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.